ഓക്കെ അസ്സലാം വാലിക്കും Can I have your attention please? Jazakumullah al khair Brother Abdul Hakim. I think that was a wonderful way to explain what is Islam and who is a Muslim. Uh, could you please remember the idea is to give an opportunity for those who want to know more about the community, about the founders of this community such as Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Quran, the Kaaba and all those things Shah Abdul Hakim was talking about. Could you please give a chance for those who are not Muslim to ask the questions? I know many Muslims would like to ask him. It's very hard to find Abdul Hakim. But give those who are not Muslim the chance. And you can ask any question, inshallah, and it will be answered. Shukran, jazakumullah khair. I also just wanted to say to everyone, uh, jazakallah khair for Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad for giving us this amazing speech, giving us his time. You can obviously see he's a very busy man. Oh, mashallah. I also wanted to say to everyone that please stay to the end because we're going to have some amazing music by Abdul Salam and desserts will be served right at the end. So <laughs> you have to save that. We also, All for Aid has an art exhibition right in the main corner. And that just shows our time in uh, Jampur. We went to the flood, re flood region in Pakistan. So I'm going to hand it over to Isa and I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. Point them out for me. Um, so, the first, we'd like to first take a non Muslim question. If anyone's got one, okay. Yes, I have. Uh, my name is Robert Dunwell. Mm -hmm. um, I was invited here by the IHRC okay. from North uh, London. What's this? Uh, a very interesting talk uh, and a description. Thank you. Um, in the earlier part of your talk, you mentioned, especially, I think, I, I'm correct in saying you emphasize that the Western world uh, some time ago has uh, diverted or lost this depth and understanding of, of faith which it previously had and which, and, which other me and which other areas of the world still have to some extent, either less or greater. Now, the, the question is, would you say that perhaps has got anything to do with basic human struggle? The, um, the point I'm trying to ask is that when human beings, and you started your talk on basis of humanity, yeah, when people tend, tend to struggle, they tend to group together, they tend to have what we can call is a better faith because they need, there's a need for people to come together to improve their mm -hmm. struggle. When that, for whatever reason or however, that struggle is made easier or, see, or there's no reason to struggle to, say for example, to, to gain your daily bread, you're not going to starve, you're not going to... You're always going to have some sort of uh, house or room to go to. The basic of the basic fundamentals of hu of human existence. Yeah? When that becomes a lot easier or is made so it's automatic, struggle, in that sense, ceases. Mm -hmm. Is I'd, uh, certainly uh, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on if you think that sort of thing has caused the societies in different parts of the world to lose their structure of faith. Yeah. I think that's quite a profound point and I'm not sure they have a terribly good yes or no answer to it. Um, there are cases where people have struggled in the West but that struggle has not triggered a religious revival and you could say that a the Second World War um, resulted for the Jewish people and for many Christians in Europe as a, in, in a kind of spiritual collapse rather than a return to religion. Uh, and it's also the case that some places which seem to be materially very comfortable where religion is fairly buoyant, like some of the southern states of, the, of, of America, for instance, although perhaps it's not too cynical to suggest that the kind of Christianity that happens in some of those right-wing churches is a little bit removed from what Christianity is often been um, historically. But yeah, I, I think the basic point is, is, is 
true that we as a species tend to thrive uh, inwardly in adversity and that if death is uh, something that we see a lot and experience a lot and are afraid of imminently, we do tend to think about our mortality and more profound things and sometimes that can result in uh, a more natural and stable and spiritual form of life. In much of Africa, for instance, I was in um, Senegal last month and the people there are extremely poor but you go to the villages where you know, malaria is endemic and there's a lot of in infant mortality people have a very tough life there but you never see anybody who isn't smiling whether they're Muslims or Christians the women sort of pounding the meal in the market square they're all smiling all the time and it's because of faith and I think that faith is to some extent made easier for them by the fact that the uh, sort of immediate comforts and treats and pleasures of this world aren't something that they've experienced. This world is um, a distraction, as all the religions recognize. The more we have our nose in the trough because there's stuff there, the less likely we are to think about uh, anything else. So, yeah, um, don't get too comfortable is, is our message, I think. Marsha, that's a good question. Uh, anyone else got a question? Okay. Stay the question, I'll repeat it. I'm going to shout it back out to all of us. Can you explain takfirism? Uh, very briefly, this is the idea that uh, somebody who commits a mortal sin is no longer a Muslim. You anathematize them. Uh, mainstream Sunni and mainstream Shi'i Islam, the two big sects or branches of the Muslim family, both say that to commit a mortal sin doesn't make you an unbeliever. But takfir is the idea that if you do commit a mortal sin, um, you're outside the fold of Islam. Just like anyone got a question? Uh, I'm not sure if I can my mic can reach. So just. Okay, I'll, try and speak I'll, I'll repeat for everyone. Um, yeah. Just that idea of God being with like, the downtrodden and the outcast, and then that idea that I get raised in this and um, that there's um, there's there's not a like celebration, I guess, or like, embracing of people that are like criminal or homosexual. Um, so how, how does God treat the, the sinners? Okay, like there's one idea that God's with the downtrodden and the outcast. God's with the downtrodden. But then we as people, I guess, as religious people as well, tend to outcast the people. How do those two ideas okay. kind of mesh together? So if God is with the downtrodden and religious, um, we outcast those who are sinners, essentially. Yes, um, all the monotheisms would say that God is with the sinner, but not with the sin. And that uh, one can empathize with an outcast criminal or maybe a child sex offender or whoever, but that doesn't mean that you empathize with them in the disposition of their soul which they're in when they're committing that particular crime. The, f the fact that you're uh, engaging with and empathizing with people who are societally rejected doesn't justify legitimizing everything that they've done. Okay, thank you very much. Is there a question at the back? So, so Ivana, we could just shout it down to me and I'll, I'll repeat it again for everyone. Okay, so the question was, uh, loving and hating for the sake of God, and what is the definition of a disbeliever? Well, the Qur'an makes a number of uh, distinctions. For instance, the Christians and the Jews are classified as Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, because they've received revelations in, par in the past. So it says, for instance, you will find the closest of people in affection to the Muslims to be those who say, we are Christians. So clearly, a straightforward attitude of hate for that category is ruled out by the Qur'anic text. Um, but it is the case that I guess um, the Bible as well as the Qur'an will say that uh, purely idolatrous and demonic forms of religion are to be hated. 
And uh, we've all tried to differentiate between the sin and the sinner. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. In practice, it's not always as simple as that. Uh, it's very difficult to detach people from the conscious intentions and the decisions that they make. Um, but we do have sayings, for instance, Ahlul Mahabba Lillah, Atafu ala ahlin ma'asi lillah, maqatu a'amalahum wa atafu alayhim. The people who love God uh, feel sorry for those who disobey God. They deplore their actions, but they feel sorry for them. So it may be unrealistic for us to say, we hate sinners, we, we, we love sinners. So we love Stalin, we love um, pedophiles, we love, it becomes kind of trivializing if you indifferently say we love all sinners. Uh, potentially there is something that's in the image of God in those people that we hope will be released from, from their sin. But Muslims would not say in a kind of generalizing, uh, indifferent way that we love all sinners, no. Um, there are people who are genuinely bringing evil to the world who uh, one can legitimately hate. Um, my question is uh, based on your references to Rumi. Mm -hmm. What is the difference, if any, between Sufism and Islam? Uh, Sufism is generally, that is to say by the majority of Muslims, past and present, defined as the inner or spiritual or esoteric dimension of Islam. It's the inward spirituality of the religion, just as Judaism has its own Hasidic or Kabbalah traditions within it. Sufism evolved within the context of Quranic piety and is a subset of the religion of Islam. There are, because Islam is very diverse, and no doubt I should have pointed out that rather obvious fact, there are Muslims uh, who say that Sufism is a subsequent extraneous intrusion and should be um, ruled out, but the great majority of Muslim scholars, if you travel through the Muslim world, you'll find they are themselves personally involved in one or another of the great uh, Sufi orders. So if you study in any of, in either of the major traditions in which British Muslim imams are trained, the Deobandi and the Brailvi, both of those traditions in their mother madrasas in India have tremendous respect for Rumi and uh, expect their students to be familiar with his poetry. Okay, another question? Yeah, go on. As a, as someone who converted to an adult, is there anything, was there anything in either Islam or in Islamic culture that you found difficult to take or accept? Yeah, getting up at 4 30 in the morning. <laughs> 30 years on, it's still kind of like the first time every time. Um, but in terms, I mean, seriously. Uh, My, my experience of it was that I was kind of coming home. I immediately felt very much at ease with conservative Muslim values and the separation of the sexes and no alcohol and the kind of uh, familiar courtesies, body language of Muslims. I immediately found myself very relaxed and, and at ease with that. I, uh, it wasn't what I expected. I had no idea what it would be like to be a convert and I'd never particularly been a a sensation-seeking person, but my convictions led me to Islam. But if, sometimes I describe it as having been sat on a wooden stool and then finding a nice comfortable armchair to sit in. I really felt deeply comfortable and at ease after becoming Muslim, despite getting up at 4.30 in the morning. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. Okay, go on. Um, research shows that Islam is now one of the fastest-growing religions. I just want to go back to you. What made you come to Islam in terms of Islam? Well, you don't get the main thoughts if I... If I explain that. Um, there's a little thing on the internet which sort of gives the, the story. Um, I, I guess it was the result of a teenage quest for certainty, staying up late at night with my Nescafe and riffling through texts of the major world religions, uh, and coming from a Christian background, finally admitting to myself that I didn't believe in any of the core doctrines of the church. And I asked my school chaplain whether he could explain them, and he actually couldn't. The doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the dual nature of Christ, the doctrine of the vicarious atonement. I just couldn't buy into any of them. So I ended up for a while in the Unitarian Church, but um, found that 
after a while, a rather unlikely repository for final and universal truth. Um, and I ended up where I hadn't imagined going as probably rather conservative, middle-of-the-road, unadventurous person in, in the context of Islam, which was not what I started out looking for at all. But um, here I am. I always find it's a very difficult question to answer when you're converted. Um, any other question at the back? Go on. <laughs> I, I get about 600 emails a day and so recently I kind of tried to figure out how to cut them down and I then calculated which ones I was likely to reply to and I did a calculation and I'm happy to admit that I was twice as likely to reply to somebody who obviously had quite a bit of money. And I was also <laughs> twice as likely to reply to women as to men. <laughs> That's what I came up with. Um, uh, so uh, you, can try, you can try emailing me. Uh, but um, often I just demagnetize things that come in, I'm afraid. And I'm just not very good at, at, at managing that. Uh, and sometimes I get questions that uh, annoy me. Recently somebody phoned me. I hope he's not here. <laughs> it was after 11 p.m. And he said, Sheikh, Sheikh, is, uh, uh, could you tell me, is it all right for me to read my namaz wearing a tiger skin? <laughs> uh, he, I think he was serious, but... Um, <laughs> The, the, the ruling that I gave him was uh, rather uh, acerbically expressed. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if it's a serious question, and then I'd, I'd be happy to, to look at it. Um, you can work out my email from the University of Cambridge website, but it may take a bit of time before I get, that, get to it. So a lesson in patience there. Okay, got another question at the back? Big voice. It depends to some extent where you're coming from. If you have a, a traditional Christian background, then you might want a certain type of book that explains it in those terms. Um, one of the things that I found most effective is a book called The Vision of Islam by William Chittick and Sachiko Murata, two Muslims who are teaching at the State University of New York. And uh, I think, although like all works of human authorship, it contains a few oddities, it's possibly the best general introduction to Islam that I've seen. Very kind of um, easy reading, non-judgmental, non-polemical. in front of a, uh, a scholar who can talk them through the arguments. Teenagers are not always easy to deal with, but um, the religion does have scholars and leaders, and these issues have been discussed and resolved. I'll be going across the room. Yes, of course. Um, Block of the exit. As, <laughs> I often find, however, that Muslims 
haven't taken the trouble to learn enough about their own religion and their neighbors' religions to make it a really fruitful discussion rather than just an exchange of information about each other's dietary preferences and festivals. Oh, the Wolf Institute. Uh, I think the same um, comment would apply. Another question here? So if you have a question here. Uh, yeah, I was just hoping if you could summarize or highlight some of the important things um, about free will in Islam. I know that's kind of a big question, but could you explain some of the main differences between free will in Islam and free will in Christianity and so forth during Calvinism? Okay, I mean, neither Islam nor Christianity has been historically unanimous on this question. Calvin takes a different view to Aquinas, and in Islam, Ghazali takes a different view from Jahm ibn Safwan. Uh, it's a tough one. Uh, very briefly expressed, but not adequately justified. Um, early Islam saw a schism between people called the Mu'tazilites, who believed that there's some things God doesn't do in creation, human beings do them, and human beings are the creations of their act, creators of their acts. Another sect, called the Jabriya, who say we're completely passive and helpless and there's total predestination and there's no human agency of any kind. The movement that um, came to be recognized as Sunni orthodoxy, which has several forms, Asherism is the best known form, developed a theology whereby God creates human acts, but human beings acquire the act that God creates. There is something within us that is genuinely capable of attributing ourselves morally to the phenomena in the physical world that are subject to the laws that God has dictated for the world. But the Arabs also say if anything is more difficult to understand, it's the, this doctrine of acquisition. It's a proverb in Arabic, adaqu min kasbil ash'ari, they say. If something really blows your mind, they say it's harder to understand than the acquisition doctrine of, of al-ash'ari. There are explanations, but it's volumes, and I suspect many of them don't quite get to the bottom of what ultimately will always be uh, paradox for monotheists. So one question, question here? Yeah. Um, I know in, in the, uh, sorry, my voice is going a bit, but I know in the Quran it says that Jesus wasn't crucified. There was a deception, someone was crucified in his place. And I'm just wondering, uh, is, is there any answer in Islam as to why there had to be such a deception that creates a lot of contradiction between Christianity and Islam? And um, this took place. Uh, it's not clear that it was the frustrating thing for Muslims is that there is in the huge quantity of Quranic verses and hadiths just the one verse that refers to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, which just says, referring to the Jews, they did not crucify him, they did not kill him, it was made to appear so unto them. And that's all you get. So if you look at the classical commentaries, you find there's a range of different interpretations. And there are Muslims who say that no, he was crucified, but it wasn't the Jews who did it. That's what the text says. It was an exoneration of the Jews. It was the Romans. And that seems to me to be a possible interpretation of the text. Other Muslims came to the view that, well, a range of views, one of which was that um, somebody, um, perhaps Simon of Cyrene, perhaps Judas Iscariot, who was never finally determined, was transfigured so he looked like Jesus and was crucified in his place so that the innocent one was spared and a guilty one was crucified in his place. But that's never been part of Muslim aqidah or doctrine. That's just a speculation in medieval interpretation. I guess the deeper point at stake is not so much the historicity of the event, but whether it is true that Jesus died to save humanity from original sin. And certainly Muslims would say, no, God doesn't operate in that way. God reminds us, God wakes us up, we need to be reoriented towards God. When that happens, God will accept us, warts and all. And we don't need a cosmic sacrifice, an innocent son of God, an innocent victim, in order to carry our sins to atone for the, the, the sinfulness of humanity and Adam. So that's a real divergence. Um, whether it's actually implicit in that particular enigmatic Quranic verse is, is not so clear. Yeah, no, uh, just over the last 10 years, a lot of people have uh, tended to uh, link Islam with violence. Uh, and you mentioned the clash of civilizations as well uh, during your uh, talk. Now, my question was, you also mentioned how Islam spread um, 
into other parts of, well, in, in Europe and the Middle East. And I was just wondering, when people talk about the spread, a lot of people tend to talk, talk about how it was by the sword rather than in a peaceful way. And I was just wondering, could you elaborate on how it was spread initially, and whether it was in a peaceful or a violent way? Well, politically, the rule of Muslim sultans and caliphs was spread militarily. Spiritually, there was a very different story, and in most of those countries, it took several centuries before people finally converted to Islam. In some places, it was rapid. In many other countries, the process was never completed. In Egypt, for instance, Syria, 10% of the population is still Christian. There was never an attempt systematically to um, convert people. So you have to differentiate between the, the political spread of the religion and its spiritual spread, and the two are not coterminous. Indonesia, which is uh, the most populous Muslim country um, was never conquered by Arab or Muslim armies, but the religion spread there through trading and uh, sort of peaceful missionary work. And the same with Muslims in China, much of Central Asia and, and Black Africa and elsewhere. So you need to differentiate between the political clout of Muslim rulers, many of whom um, had actually quite profane motivations, and uh, the spiritual victor victories of the religion, which came quite a bit later. But to, to link it to your earlier point, it's true that Islam does have a doctrine of just war. The founder of the religion is not a pacifist. Christianity has to square the circle of the undoubted categoric pacifism of the Gospels with its subsequent recognition that sometimes in this world you have to defend yourself, you have to go to war. Islam has a just war doctrine written into its uh, original story. So when President Bush and some airheaded Muslims say, Islam religion of peace, that's not, it's not a religion of pacifism. Peace is the ultimate objective, of course, it's pleasing to God, but um, war is sometimes uh, a necessary route to establishing God's peace. Okay, good. Thank you all very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much.